Welcome. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. And each year, the Naval Institute and the U.S. Naval Academy host an applied history conference. We explore an important topic, its place in history, the current situation, and the implications for the future. Our theme this year is sharing the story of the U.S. military through the camera lens. We're deeply grateful to the William M. Wood Foundation for sponsoring this conference. When selecting this year's topic, we predicted the hypercharged political environment, but we certainly didn't predict COVID. And we typically host this conference in Alumni Hall at the Naval Academy in front of a large midshipman audience. However, due to COVID, we're hosting this conference for the first time ever virtually. We're thrilled to be able to bring it to a larger audience, but hope we will be together in person soon. Given it's 2020, we're looking for a more lighthearted theme, but at the same time, an historically important and timely theme. We believe we've assembled just that. And as all great movies do, we hope to give you a little bit of escape from reality. Over the next two days, we are privileged to have with us a distinguished group of actors, directors, producers, alongside government, military, and academic leaders to explore the history of the US military in the movies. We've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Sean Baker, Assistant Director at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the Naval Academy in developing the program. We've also had strong support from the team at Three Penny Films, including Jess Atkinson and Joe Schreiber. You'll get a chance to see Dr. Baker and the Three Penny Films team over the next two days, and we thank them for their support and contributions. Additionally, we've had excellent support from the ethics team at the Naval Academy, and in particular, midshipman Kenneth Stelmack. He serves as president of the team and helped us assemble a group of midshipmen to assist with conference execution and promotion. We hope you enjoy their contributions throughout, and we thank them for participating. Thank you again for joining, and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Admiral Daly. First on the agenda this afternoon is a history of the military and the movies for the last 100 years. World War I to the present day. We have one of the foremost experts in this arena, retired Marine Corps Captain Dale A. Dye. After his 20 years in the Marine Corps, including combat action in Vietnam and Beirut, he turned to writing, acting, and consulting Hollywood on military matters. He will discuss how the military has been portrayed in the movies, his experience working with the film industry, and the evolving relationship between the DOD and Hollywood. Sounds like a great segment to get this event started. Before we turn it over to Captain Dye, please enjoy this video intro. Pull the weapon off your shoulder. I'm Captain Dale Dye. I run a company uh, in Hollywood called Warriors Incorporated. We are the uh, premier military advisors for uh, motion pictures and television. I believe that there's a certain heart and a certain spirit that's common throughout fighting men. And I think that actors who are like dry sponges until you pour on the water and the liquid and that sort of thing, need to be immersed in the rigorous lifestyle, in the horrors that infantrymen and combat people all over the world face. Getting to work on a project like this, to be a part of a story that, that's on the scope that this is on. As an actor, it's a dream come true. They went through a brutal period of training. It was designed to be that way, just so they would understand what maybe the people they're portraying, to some extent, what they endured. You feel invincible. You feel like you can get through anything. If you can get through that, you can get through anything. Fire! Go! You can't buy this, this kind of experience. You know, given the nature of this project and how important it is to, to tell the truth, I'm a United States Marine and uh, was one on active duty for 22 years. He has a way of taking a group of uh, actors, talented as they are, and then just beating that acting stuff out of them and turning them into soldiers. Send, it, send rockets! I'll tell you that all of us will feel, will tell you that if we hadn't gone through that, we never would have been able to get through the first day of shooting. come together. This is the man who trained all of us to look like military and forest guns. 
They've been taken out of their comfort zone. They've been forced to live hard and raw. They've been forced to confront discipline where no excuse works. They've got to do what they need to do. Captain Dye said to us in boot camp, I want you to bring honor to that fraternity of men that died for your freedom. And uh, to me, I think that that is something that I'll always carry in the file throughout this film. Many thanks to all of you out there in the ether somewhere who are joining us today. Sorry we can't do this in person. As an actor, I like to read the room and adjust, but I'll have to fire for effect and hope I'm on target. On the other hand, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Hopefully, we'll wind up with a larger audience staring at computer screens than we could ever stuff into an auditorium or lecture hall. I'm here to talk about a topic I love, namely war movies, or more generally, any feature film or TV project with a military theme. Like most of you, I suspect, I've always been a fan of these movies or TV shows, hoping they'd give audiences a little glimpse into the life I lived and you lived or are living in uniform. Unfortunately, most of them did not. In fact, Way too many of them, and excuse my language here, way too many of them just pissed me off because of inaccurate depictions of the life I lived and the military brothers and sisters I loved. So, 30 years ago, totally ignorant of how the movie business works, I decided to do something about it. How I managed to get a crack at that is a long story involving some things for which the criminal statute of limitations has probably not yet expired. So let's skip it for now and say I just got lucky. My agenda when I charged into the fray was relatively simple. I wanted to help shine some long overdue realistic light on the service and sacrifice of our American military, any war, any generation, any period of history. And to date, my folks and I have served as advisors on films that go as far back as ancient Greece, that was Alexander, and as far into the future as the 25th century with Starship Troopers. I like to say at Warriors Inc. that we'll do anything from the Peloponnesian Wars to Star Wars. But the basic agenda never changes. When I undertake a project, I feel like I'm a very lucky representative of everyone who has ever worn the uniform. Anyone who's heard the owl or seen the elephant in combat, I consider it my duty, and this is a matter of personal honor, to do everything I can to help present the truth of our service, the good along with the bad, in a relatively accurate and entertaining manner. So is that important? After all, it's just a movie or a TV program, right? So does it really matter? Well, I think it does in a lot of ways beyond simple entertainment. Despite some revisionist slant, glaring technical errors and blatant flag waving in many war movies throughout cinema history, the fact is war films have become a permanent fixture in the American cultural experience. As far back as 1898, when a silent short called Tearing Down the Spanish Flag premiered featuring Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders charging up San Juan Hill, American audiences have generally enjoyed war movies. Movies in a similar vein over the years as technology developed continued to draw huge crowds. The Civil War got cinema treatment in 1915 with Birth of a Nation and drew people to theaters and throngs. There were even immensely popular military comedies, such as Charlie Chaplin's Shoulder Arms in 1918, where Chaplin single-handedly captures the Kaiser. It's a fact that war movies have continued to draw big audiences, no matter what war or conflict is involved in the storytelling. Major conflicts, such as World War II, Korea, Vietnam and virtually every shooting engagement before, in between, and after 
have been the subject of one or more movies. Despite ups and downs in society, changing national ideologies, and more sophisticated audiences, war movies continue to appeal and enthrall. The stories on spooling on the screen appeal to young men and women yearning for adventure, often draw crowds of veterans recalling moments of triumph or tragedy. And before we knew it, or before we even stopped to think about it, movies became instruments of learning. Now, that's an important aspect of the business to me. So let me expound a bit. Military themed movies and television programs can help us teach history. And we desperately need that these days. Historical literacy is abysmal in the United States and almost equally poor the world over. Most people do not read history books. They get what little historical awareness they have through movies, TV, or the internet in one form or another. Given that, movies about real wars, reflecting the experience of real battles or campaigns, might be the only way a majority of people come to any understanding of our military history. The fact is, war films and military stories made for the popular media can and do have an effect on national culture. There are numerous examples from our recent past that indicate a good and credible story about a war can have a very profound effect on our population. Take Platoon, for example. Now, it's a very controversial film, but like it or not, it had a profound effect on American society. It was a full decade after the end of the war in Vietnam before Oliver Stone was able to convince a couple of producers, and they were British, ironically, to attempt a commercial project about the war in Vietnam based on his own experience as a combat infantryman. And in a stroke of brilliance, he hired me as his military advisor and helped launch my career as both an advisor and an actor. But enough about that. What's germane here is the effect Platoon had on a generation of poorly treated veterans and their families. When the film was released to great critical acclaim, Vietnam veterans who'd been literally in the closet for the past decade came roaring out and began hauling their friends and families to see Platoon. They began to talk about their experiences at war for the first time using the film as a catalyst. In effect, a single movie served as an icebreaker for an entire generation of combat veterans. Now, more positive portrayals like We Were Soldiers Once and Young soon followed. The attitude of the general public slowly changed as a result of these films. So I'd have to say they had a significant effect on attitudes and opinions worldwide. There were a lot of emotional and political chasms bridged between a generation of vets and the public that had largely shunned them. All right, so why war movies? Why are they so continually popular the world over? I mean, war is a fairly grim topic, right? Well, Consider this, the United States has been at war of one kind or another about 92% of the time since its inception. And for most of that time, American society has generally shown a reverence for the military. But there's more to it than that. What makes screenwriters want to write about war, whether they've actually experienced it or not, is that life and death situations make terrific drama. And that's what combat is for the most part. It's a crapshoot where generally winners survive and losers don't. Ernest Hemingway had it absolutely right when he said that war is man's greatest adventure. There's very little a human being will ever experience that matches the emotional turmoil and the excitement of mortal combat. In combat, the full gamut of human behavior is on display, from the very best to the very worst and everything in between. 
And much of that display is visually astounding to people who've never actually experienced combat. So it's a natural enticing subject for movie makers. It's the dramatic well that never runs dry. Now at this point, I think you'll likely agree with me that military movies and TV programs have an effect on our image and acceptance among civilian audiences. So how about practical matters? Do military movies and TV shows give us a boost in recruiting the talented young men and women we need to fill the ranks? Well, to answer that, let's take a look at a little film that should be familiar to members of the U.S. Naval Institute, not to mention the entire world. Top Gun was the highest grossing movie of 1986. Box office revenues topped more than 176 million. But more importantly, the film showed that it could be cool to be in the military. In 1985, the number of uniformed personnel in uh, the armed forces was 2.15 million. A year after Top Gun was released, that number had increased by more than 20,000 across all services. The Navy saw an increase from 571,000 uniformed personnel in 1985 to almost 587,000 at the end of fiscal year 1987. The numbers were up for the Air Force and the Marines as well. Only the Army's numbers were relatively flat for the time period, but I think we made up for some of that shortfall with films like Saving Private Ryan and the TV miniseries Band of Brothers. You'd be surprised I consistently run into soldiers who tell me they enlisted because they were influenced by those two projects. Now, over the years I've worked in show business, I've struggled to understand all this and come to a few conclusions that I'll outline for you here today. In the motion picture and TV pursuits, I think there is an attempt, usually unconscious, among screenwriters to gauge the mood of the nation and try to write something that will appeal to whatever they think that is. That's the business aspect of show business, and it dominates. If your average A-list Hollywood screenwriter is contemplating a war movie about Iraq or Afghanistan, for instance, and, and has no firsthand experience with those conflicts, he or she is likely to shape the story according to what's presented in the news media for good or ill. Now, if the Hollywood writer is a liberal bent, and most of them are, then the underlying politics of the story will be that a bunch of good-hearted American boys and girls were sent on a stupid jingoistic mission where they suffered huge mental and physical damage. That's the quick and dirty of it. But there are screenwriters who feel a need to dig a little deeper into the drama. They'll spend some time reading, researching, talking to actual veterans. And when they do this, or when a script is actually written by a veteran, and somehow miraculously gets an actual reading at a studio or a production entity, it's an entirely different story. The bottom line consideration is that a good dramatic story, well told, stands a chance of getting made into a movie, a TV film, or a series. And then the real war starts. Most war films do a bang up job, literally, of depicting the noisy chaos of combat, but too many fail to put it all in the context that actual veterans would recognize from their personal experiences on various battlefields. Now, this is usually because there are very damn few actual combat veterans in any aspect of the movie making business. The result is a rehash of all the bad war movies they've seen in the past, rather than an accurate, relatable exploration of the personal relationships between soldiers and extremists, which is the heart and soul of the experience. I don't have to tell you that Soldiers don't risk their lives fighting for the flag, some high-flown political principle, mom or apple pie. They fight for each other. And success is measured by never letting the other guy or gal down. 
That's what movie makers too often don't get. And it's the reason why my isolation style, hard ass, full immersion training methods have proved so popular and successful. See, I train actors to be soldiers by working from the inside out. The key is to impact their hearts, their minds, and their emotions. To make them understand on a visceral level that special relationship that develops between soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in combat. And once I'm able to give actors a, at least a nodding acquaintance with that alien concept, the business of teaching the mechanical stuff is easy. That's what we got right with pictures like Saving Private Ryan, for instance. Steven Spielberg recognized it was the relationships between his soldiers on a quest that was the heart of the story. It's what they got wrong, for instance, with Hurt Locker. Because the hot rod longer, taking stupid risks as an EOD tech, had nothing to do with reality. And his relationships with other soldiers were more than a little far-fetched. American Sniper is more a story about the psychological damage that continued deployment to a brutal war can do to a man than it is a story about war itself. Now, it rang true with veterans who knew the reality of that, and with audiences who've been continuously spoon-fed lurid tales of PTSD suffering. And it didn't hurt that poor Chris Kyle died in a very tragic manner before the film was released. As for Lone Survivor, I think it was a good story, not so well told. We saw lots of SEAL training and ordeals and some good combat sequences that most veterans related to in the film. But the movie makers missed the beats that talked about relationships between warriors, and that's the heart of the book. They made a few sloppy passes at it, but in my opinion, what wound up on the screen seemed like an inside look at some kind of military frat house. And that rang false to most of the veteran community, since the vast majority of them were not SEALs, or any other kind of special operators. And smart movie makers recognize that they need guidance to help them from tripping off the gun line into comic book land. So they hire an actual veteran or a professional movie advisor like me, keep them straight, and to help guide the actors through performances in an alien landscape. When they do that, <laughs> And when they pay attention to the guidance provided, they usually wind up with critical acclaim, such as feels shockingly real or puts you in the midst of chaotic battle. Although not many movie makers realize it, what they're doing by employing such advisors who usually do the necessary research for them is mitigating the cognitive dissonance between what their prospective audiences have seen ad nauseum on TV live from the battlefield or on the History Channel and what they expect to see on the big screen. There are hundreds of relatively small things that always irk me and that I pay particular attention to correcting when I'm hired to work on military-themed movies. You know the things I'm talking about, military berets that are worn so awkwardly that they have actors looking like they've just strolled into a scene wearing a pizza plate on their heads. That's one example. A couple of others are using gas bags to impart flame into explosions when real high explosive is generally almost entirely black smoke and brown dust. And then there's the exaggerated dance that people are instructed to do while they simulate being struck by bullets. Well, that's totally false. Usually real casualties just fold inward or crumple with no drama involved, which is the actual drama. There are a bunch of others, some more obvious like the wrong weapon for the right war, bad haircuts or totally cocked up uniforms, but you get the idea and you spot them all. Now, I focus on each and every detail with the assurance that the one I miss 
will be the one that every veteran and every audience will catch. In every movie or TV project I work on, I want there to be that one moment when every veteran in the audience feels the hair on the back of his neck stand up and he silently says, there it is. That's what I remember from my war. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. I'd be glad to take some questions. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. I have the distinct pleasure this afternoon to share your questions with Captain Dye. Please submit your questions through the Q&A engagement tool on your screen. We'll do our best to address as many questions as possible during the hour we have together. So let's jump right into it. Captain Dye, uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you, sir. Wonderful presentation. Thanks, Eric. I'm glad, glad to be here. Um, you're a legend in the industry. It goes without saying. And um, well, here's a couple good ones right away here. Um, the portrayal of combat has become so much more immersive and graphic in modern war films, especially starting with Saving Private Ryan, which I think anybody can agree was a pioneering film in regards to how it depicted combat. So much so that older blockbuster war pictures feel somewhat rendered obsolete. Despite this, what are some of the standout war movie classics of earlier decades that still stand the test of time in terms of vividly depicting battle action? Well, there's a, there's any number of uh, really good ones, I think. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of The Bridges at Toko Ri. Uh, I'm a big fan of 12 O'Clock High. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of a little uh, movie by Sam Fuller uh, called Steel Helmet. Um, which is about the Korean War. If you haven't seen that one and you're a movie fan, make sure you find it. Uh, so they're there, but I find um, what the common denominator seems to be that, that if, if the story is really good and really talks about uh, the relationships of, of soldiers and extremists, um, you can forgive a lot of the hokey special effects and, and over-the-top uh, sort of renderings uh, that, that aren't really what combat is about, but are designed to somehow thrill and, and uh, viscerally involve an audience. They're, they're out there, but, but the ones that, that I think are, are outstanding are really the ones that are built around a good core story. Eric, I didn't hear you. You want to try again? Okay. How are we now? Yeah, good. Okay, great. Yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned uh, Sam Fuller, and um, I thought about him during your talk because uh, you spoke of how the camaraderie of people in battle is such a key thing to really capture the truth of it. And uh, the Big Red One, his World War II film, um, was all about that camaraderie. And I, I remember reading an interview with him where that, he said the same thing, where if you don't have that in there, that they're fighting for each other in a life-and-death situation, you're missing the um, gist of it. And I think it's interesting how Fuller himself is a World War II veteran, and so he was able to bring that verisimilitude, like you yourself do, um, it's often like that's more the thing than the inaccurate hairstyles that jumps out at people, I think. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, I mean, you mentioned it yourself. Uh, Fuller was, it was uh, a first uh, infantry division veteran from World War II, so he knew the deal. Uh, he was smart enough to get Lee Marvin, who was a World War II Marine, second division on Saipan, um, to, to play the role in the Big Red One. So uh, he, he inherently, and his star in that movie, inherently knew where the heart of the story was. Yes, indeed. And um, now that's an 80s movie, of course. Um, but I've noticed, and I'm sure you have, being in the industry, in the past about half decade, there's been a remarkable resurgence of World War II themed films. Hacksaw Ridge, Dunkirk, Midway, Greyhound, a whole bunch of other ones. And 
Do you get a general sense that in the motion picture industry, World War II is sort of the so-called good war, quote unquote? In other yeah, words, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Look, um, here's here's the problem with wars like Korea, uh, Vietnam, and and what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, it's difficult to draw the good guy bad guy line. Um, it's it's difficult to to give the audience that cheering factor and that boo factor. Uh, with World War II, you certainly don't have that problem. Uh, you've got clear cut, historically accurate bad guys and good guys. So it's an easy hit. It's an easy home run. Indeed. I think we'll always have World War II movies for that reason. Well, we've got some great questions rolling in. Here's one from Michael Unsworth. You advised in the film Dogfight, which did not portray the military in a positive light. How did you approach working on this film? Well, um, here's, here's the thing about Dogfight. First of all, I love the movie. Um, and I had, I had a significant influence on it, uh, but with director uh, Nancy Savoca. Um, you say it didn't project the services in, in, in a favorable light. Well, it, it, didn't, it didn't present a couple of the characters in a favorable light, certainly. Uh, but you remember, I'm, I'm, I want to work on films whether it shows a good side or a bad side, if the bad side is, uh, is accurate, is, is out there. And the fact of the matter is, when you, I've, as a young Marine, I was involved in things like that. I know it goes on. Um, and, uh, and I thought that, um, River Phoenix, God bless him, uh, who's gone now, but, uh, River got that. And, uh, and I thought it was, uh, it was an interesting take. And, and, uh, Lily Taylor, who, who played, uh, uh, the young girl that he, he originally dates to take to, uh, a who's got the ugliest date contest, um, really got it. She grasped it. And I thought it was, uh, in, in my view, it was a, it was a nice uh, element of female empowerment that went on in that, and I think Nancy Zavoka, the, the director, saw that. So I, I didn't come away from it feeling like I had given the military some kind of black eye. I certainly don't think I did. Fair enough. George Lau asks, please name the three or more most historically accurate film productions in which you participated in any capacity. Mahalo in advance. Okay. Well, look, um, I've got to I've got to go back and say that um, Saving Private Ryan is chief among them. Uh, Band of Brothers um, is up there in the ratings. Uh, the Pacific miniseries is up there in the ratings. Um, and uh, you know, I owe my career to Platoon, so I'm going to put that up there in the ratings. Although. I'd qualify that to say that that was a, a slice of life and not designed to be a broad brush of the American experience in Vietnam. That's a classic, all right. Well, here's another one for you, Captain Dai. Richard Dan asks a very cogent question. Why can't studios get the sound of a helicopter right? Every helicopter in TV and cinema sounds like a Huey. I know that is a standard soundtrack <laughs> item, but the only thing that sounds like a Huey is a Huey. How can we fix that's that? That's exactly that's exactly correct. Um, and here's the problem: uh, you can you can sit in post production in a sound studio where the sound is being juiced by technicians, and you can say, "Listen, uh, this is this is the sound of a 46 or a 47 CH 46 CH 47." Um, or, or this is the sound of a 53, or this is the sound of a Black Hawk. Um, and they all nod and say, yeah, yeah, okay, but listen to this. And then they run the soundtrack of the Huey because it, is, it has become sort of the, the, the soundtrack of helicopter life in, in movie views. And so often what happens is the, the other helicopters don't sound um, don't don't raise that that visceral reaction in audiences' ears that a Huey does. So we we've, we've got ourselves sort of locked into that. Although I uh, I continue to fight against it. Yeah, well, you're fighting an uphill battle. It just sounds cool to the audience. And what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, Michael Javeli wants to know. He, great overview. He says, by the way, time to fess up. What's the biggest mistake you didn't catch? 
Well, um, <clears throat> here, here it is, I guess, uh, and, and it goes to a movie that I worked on with Sam Jackson and, uh, and um, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, directed by Billy Friedkin, who's a great director. Um, we did a film called uh, Rules of Engagement, and uh, <laughs> what happened was we shot, we shot the, it was about the rescue where a new uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit comes to the rescue of an embattled uh, ambassador, um, and, and they evacuate him uh, in the midst of a, of a rioting crowd and, and so on. So we, we shot in Morocco, and we borrowed from the king of Morocco, who was, who's a big movie fan, uh, we borrowed helicopters from him um, to stage the landing of the Mew and the, and the rescue of the ambassador. And those were CH-47s, uh, Army and Air Force style Chinooks, dual blade helicopters. And, and so we had a great time in Morocco and we staged this really rock and roll uh, combat evacuation mission. And then we came back to the States uh, where we needed to launch the, where we needed to film the actual launch of that mission. So uh, God bless the Navy, they gave us permission to shoot aboard uh, the Iwo Jima, which was uh, uh, off off the west coast at that time. But the only helicopters available were, were Marine CH-46s. So we've got the Mew launching from an LPH uh, on CH-46 Sea Knights and then landing uh, in the, the mythical Middle Eastern country aboard uh, Army uh, Chinooks. So, you know, there wasn't anything I could do about it, and, uh, and everybody knew that it was a major mistake. And what we hoped, you know, we kind of held our nose and hoped that all of the helicopter jocks out there and everything wouldn't, uh, you know, throw frags at us and, and, and carve us to pieces. Um, and and to, the, to a large extent, they didn't. Uh, but I always laugh about it. I mean, it, it's one of the biggest laughers uh, of my movie career. That's hysterical. Yeah, that's funny. Um, it's surprising how many movies are filmed in Morocco, actually, it just as an aside. Um, I recently saw a horror movie set in the American Southwest, of all things. It was shot in Morocco. It looked great. So, yeah, well, you know. That's that's because the, the king is a huge movie fan. Uh -huh. And, and he'll, okay. he gives you all kinds of uh, tax breaks and lends you equipment. And uh, all he wants to do is just watch a shoot, uh, which we're more than happy to do. That's <laughs> something. Well, um, I'll tell you, we're big Navy movie fans here, as you can imagine, and George Hebert's question sort of touches on that. Captain, as a Marine, who do you feel does a good job with Navy movies? Well, I do. Um, but, but that's because I, I study it, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, uh, aboard Hayes Gray Hotels and, and other kinds of ships. And I have, a, I have a real soft spot in my heart for my Navy comrades. Uh, I know what they go through, and and I've spent a lot of time studying it. Um, and, and I've done a couple of what I think are, are really good ones. Um, Mission of the Shark, uh, which was a TNT movie about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, um, and, um, and Greyhound, uh, the most recent one uh, that we did, I think is a terrific look at the Battle of uh, the North Atlantic aboard a, uh, uh, aboard a tin can, a, uh, a Fletcher-class destroyer. Um, Look, it, it, it sort of depends. The Navy, Hollywood, Hollywood loves to make submarine movies, and it loves to make uh, naval aviation movies. Um, and, and when Hollywood writ large is willing to let the Navy in on it, and when the Navy isn't oversensitive about their image, uh, we usually get some really great stuff. There are some great ones out there, even though we tend to uh, nitpick the mistakes we find in them. That's just part of the territory, I guess. Uh, well, here's an interesting one from David Hill. What was the most difficult film or location you worked? Boy, there have been some tough ones. Um, it, it is hard as hell to work in snow. So, uh, because there's no take two, you have to you have to go out and completely broom all broom the snow over to get, be uh, pristine again. Uh, so there was a movie I did with Roy Scheider and uh, John Frankenheimer, another great director, 
and I don't mean to be name dropping here, it's just you asked the question, but um, it was called the Fourth War, and we, we just played hell. We, we shot it up in Canada, and, uh, and where we had pristine snow, and we were consistently having to wait hours while we got out and broomed the snow so that it looked pristine again, and we could go into take two. And it was miserable cold, and I hate the cold. Um, so uh, when, when you get into that situation, it's difficult. Uh, the desert uh, itself provides, as, as many uh, Afghan and uh, Iraq veterans will tell you, uh, the desert itself is a really tough environment, and it's tough to shoot in. Uh, lighting is, is a, an extraordinary problem. I mean, sunlight is magnified eight or nine times as it bounces off sand, and, and it's very difficult. And, and again, um, if, if you take a pristine look at a, at a field of sand and then you go running all over it with tanks and tracks and everything else and then you want to do take two, some poor schlub's got to get out there and rake all the sand again. So uh, where, where weather and terrain is an extreme, movie shooting is an extreme problem. Sounds like it can get pretty tough. Well, this next question is not unlike the first question I asked you, but uh, George Moore wants you to narrow it down even further. And this might be a real toughie. What is your favorite war movie? Yeah, it is a toughie, George. Um, and and um, you, to, to answer it properly, I'm going to throw it back to you. What war? Um, what service? Um, what period? I mean, I've got a bunch of them that I that I truly love, um, but uh, my absolute dead-on favorite. Um, I still have to go to um, to uh, Sam Fuller and and Steel Helmet. That little film done for two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars on the outskirts of Los Angeles has some of the most tour de force acting in it I have ever seen. Um, just, just look at, at Gene Evans playing the, the grizzled Rita Sargent and all the other characters that surround him. I mean, that's a beautiful piece of war movie storytelling. Good one. Uh, Joel Searles wants to know, Captain Die, what are the best traits of directors that you most enjoy working with? Well, I know Joel, so I know where he's going with this, but uh, I, I really enjoy working with Steven Spielberg. Uh, he's tremendous. Uh, I enjoyed uh, working with uh, Michael Mann uh, when we did Last of the Mohicans. He's good. Um, I, I, uh, I loved working with John Frankenheimer, um, a brilliant director, um, and Billy Friedkin, another a brilliant director, uh, and Oliver Stone, who's a, who's a visionary guy. I mean, he and I will never see eye to eye politically, but uh, he is a visionary director and taught me an enormous amount, as well as, uh, as launching my career. So I'd have to say that that rough handful are, are probably my favorites. Heavy hitters, one and all. Uh, Scott Spalding um, has this question in comment. It seems as though you do your best to be agnostic about the message of the stories, you will contribute to. Agnostic, I guess, is a way of saying objective. Um, how do you strike the balance between supporting a message you disagree with or, or a message that is overly jingoistic? Well, look, if, if I completely disagree with it, if I think it's an absolute falsehood, if I think there's no balance, I won't work on it. Um, I turn it down. Um, but I, there is a line. Look, I'm... I'm kind of uh, in the same boat as uh, the Department of Defense uh, is, and that is this. I'm, I'm ready to admit that we do some dumbass things, um, and as long as we highlight that and say, look, this was dumb, we don't try to present it as the right thing um, or the correct thing in a, in a particular environment. Or as long as we say that, look, the, we, we know about these things, we investigate these things, and we prosecute these things. So if there's an element of justice in it, if there's an element of balance, um, that's kind of my line. 
That, this is interesting. These um, kind of segues into this next question here from Benjamin Curry. Sir, what is your perspective on war films such as Apocalypse Now or even Full Metal Jacket that provide an excellent story but may not be intended to provide an entirely realistic view of the military? Yeah, those are two classic examples, and, and I'm glad you brought them up. Look, Apocalypse Now is, is a brilliant piece of filmmaking, um, but does it have anything to do with the American experience in Vietnam? Well, no, frankly. Uh, so what, and I didn't work on it. Um, I think it would have been a different movie if, if I did. But, um, it, you know, it, it, it's essentially an allegory. It's essentially um, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness uh, sort of uh, turned into, into a film. And um, I, I appreciate that as a filmmaker. I appreciate that as a consumer of, uh, of, of film storytelling. Um, so I, I just try not to, not to think about, uh, about what it is. I just try to enjoy it for, for its beauty, for its artistry. Well, we'll shift gears here with a question from Barbara Cassidy. Do you think there are any specific movies that would have prompted women to join the service? I understand it with the guys, but are there any movies that you think have drawn women to serve? Well, I hope so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of a movie called Courage Under Fire uh, with uh, Meg Ryan and, uh, and Denzel Washington. Uh, and the premise is that a, that a female uh, did some heroic things in combat, but because and she was being recommended for the Medal of Honor. But because she's a female and because uh, it was hard for the establishment to believe that such things could have happened, uh, they sent Denzel uh, to investigate, and, and all of that comes out. In the end, she wins out. And I think, um, I think that sort of thing is, uh, is an appropriate uh, movie. Uh, are, there, are there in general... Uh, films that would prompt uh, females to enlist and serve? Well, not so far, um, but I think that's changing. I think that's coming. I'm beginning to see scripts uh, with, uh, with female military uh, heroines, uh, and, and I hope that that continues. But I can't put my finger on a bunch of them that, that I, would, I would say, look, this is the one that, that will prompt uh, females to enlist. I just don't think so. It certainly, I wouldn't think that uh, G.I. Jane, for instance, uh, with Demi Moore, um, that, was a, that was a failed experiment, I think, uh, and probably would not uh, prompt uh, young women to want to go into the Navy special warfare community. So I, the answer is I don't think they're out there, but I think they're coming. We can only hope. Yeah, G.I. Jane. Nothing like uh, a movie about naval special war called G.I. Jane. I think they kind of <laughs> had a problem with that from the yeah. get there. Well, Kirk McAlexander is curious of your assessments of They Were Expendable, 1945, on the one hand, and The Deer Hunter, 1978, on the other. That's quite a spread of two movies there. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, look, they were expendable. It was an interesting, um, was an interesting take. Um, I think uh, took a look at, at PT boats, and that was a subject that hadn't been. Uh, it was actually prompted by President Kennedy's service on PT 109 in the Pacific, and and I think there's there's something to that. Um, pretty good film, um, accurate. Eh, there there were some gaping loopholes in that one and but that's okay it had some great performances um i think um uh, what was what was the other one uh deer hunter is that the one he was asking about yes the deer hunter okay well look the minute <laughs> that that one's full of gaping holes um you know and i'm a, i'm a big fan of uh pacino and and uh and walken and and so on so um, it's one of those in which I loved the performances, but really cringed at uh, at the at, uh, at at the story. Um, I didn't didn't care for the story at all, but I loved some of the performances. Okay, yeah, that's sort of the beginning of the Vietnam wave, or kind of at the beginning of it, uh, which of course really kicks in with Platoon, which is the real milestone of the Vietnam cycle. Um, 
James Reif wants to know, sir, I'm curious if you ever get pushback from other actors, producers, or directors who have a poor understanding of history and insist on an inaccurate military portrayal just for dramatic or visual effect. I guess the helicopter question somewhat touched on this. Yeah, I guess it did, Eric. Look, uh, the answer to that question is absolutely and constantly. Um, so sometimes I have, to, I have to put it on the line. I have to say, look, um, this is not going to fly. Um, I know it's uh, rock'em sock'em, and I know it's visually uh, just awe-inspiring, but there is a better way to do it. Look, my way of approaching this essentially is to never say no and, and end of sentence. I say no but, how about this? And I go into these kind of discussions armed with something that, that will be more in the, in the realm of reality, and yet, as a dramatist, as an actor, as a writer, I know uh, that it will convey the same element that they're trying to, to convey in the original script. So I fight that battle constantly and consistently. Most of the time, fortunately, because of my, my resume, uh, I win it. But often I don't, and I have to make a decision there. Look, do I, do I continue to work on this? Uh, do I continue to struggle and try to bring it back uh, towards something I think is a little more realistic, something a little more acceptable? Or do I just, uh, you know, pick up my ball and, and be a baby about it and go home? I've done both. Um, but but I, I think it's better to work from the inside than the outside. Here, here. Uh, well, Robert Potos wants to know, and we kind of do too here as well, are there any major projects on the horizon you can tell us about? Boy, are there. And as, as soon as we get rid of the dreaded Rona and Hollywood gets cranked back up, I've got a couple uh, sitting on the, on the uh, burner. I've got a 10-part uh, a miniseries made for television uh, about the Korean War. And I tell it uh, about the way we did with... Um, uh, easy company of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment in Band of Brothers. So it follows one company, one rifle company of Marines from the spool up order at Camp Pendleton all the way through the Korean War in 10 episodes for television. So that one's sitting out there. Um, I've got a, another World War II film uh, that I'm developing called No Better Place to Die, which is the story of an epic fight uh, on D-Day uh, for kept the capture of the Lafayette Bridge in Normandy uh, by the 82nd Airborne. And I'm, I'm forced to do that one because uh, we, we did so much for the 101st uh, Airborne Division in uh, Band of Brothers that the 82nd has been beating me up for years, trying to get me to do something about the 82nd. So, so that one is cooking out there. And there, there are a few other things, uh, but those, those I would have to say are the two big ones on my horizon. Sound very promising. Um, well, a lot of the webinar attendees have been asking you for movie recommendations or opinions, but here's someone who wants to ask you some reading recommendations. Clinton Hubbard wants to know, what do you read to stay current on military affairs and techniques? Well, look, um, I am, I'm a huge um, military supporter, obviously, so I read stuff that would put you to sleep. I mean, I, I read the journals, I read uh, Naval Institute Proceedings, I read the Infantry Journal, I, I read the Marine Corps Gazette, uh, and, and believe it or not, I have a library with about 1,200 volumes in it, and some of those volumes are field manuals, <laughs> current field manuals, and I actually read them. Um, and and I'm, I'm well connected uh, in the military community, thank goodness. Um, and so I, I can get I can get little tips and, and uh, TTPs and that sort of thing that people will send me and say, have you seen this? And, and that's all fodder for me. I mean, I, I just love that stuff, and, and I read it uh, consistently. I'm eclectic, though. I'll read it across the board. If it's Air Force, I'll read that. If it's Marines, I'll read that. Army, I'll read that. Navy, I'll read that. Um, and and I'm, if I'm not doing anything else, you can bet I'm reading. Well, we love that here at the Institute. We love to hear that always. Um, here's a very interesting one from Francis Haycock. Thank you for your presentation, Captain Dye. 
Are there any examples that you can think of where military-themed movies have had an influence on real-life military practice or policy? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Um, I would have to say, Francis, that, that what some movies have had an effect on is um, the military's public affairs policies. Uh, I think it is it has come to the realization on the part of the folks who, who who worry constantly about our image and our recruiting efforts and so on and so forth that there's real value in in just getting it out there and telling it like it is and and letting audiences see who we really are uh, above and beyond all the hype. I think it has changed that, and I'm very glad to see it. Uh, we're not overly protective. We're we're willing to say, look. Uh, it is who we are, and we strive in everything we do to try to be proper and to try to be worthy and to try to be um, uh, respectable guardians of our democracy. Uh, and, and if we go there and if we're willing to say, okay, occasionally we screw it up, but we, we find out when we screw it up and we fix it, uh, I think it has that change. Uh, the answer to whether it's had any technological change, I don't know. Uh, I will say that I think the use of drones, uh, which we kind of pioneered in the movie business um, by hanging cameras on them, uh, has probably had some influence. Um, but other than that, I, I think it's more been an imagery influence than it has been a technological influence. Here's a very intriguing question from Scott Spaulding. How great of a role does the need for DOD support, like the use of equipment, affect the scripts or stories that are told? Does CGI make it easier to tell the stories without DOD support? Well, the direct answer to that is yes. Uh, CGI does make it uh, easier to do it. But it's got to be good CGI. Audiences are very sophisticated these days. Uh, primarily because of the online experience, um, and they know crappy CGI when they see it. So if you cheap shot CGI, um, it's not helpful. But if you do it really well, it's very helpful. Now, to address the business of, of how important is DOD cooperation, it depends. Um, look, if, if we're doing a World War II movie, um, DOD uh, or any element of the Department of Defense is not going to be very much help to us. Uh, you know, they don't they don't have M4 Sherman tanks laying around that they can lend us or or M1 rifles. Um, so uh, if it's a period piece, uh, it's really not uh, crucial to us, um, with the possible exception of some Navy ships, which uh, it's it's handy to get, and they're very hard to get, by the way. Um, I think I think if we're doing really modern stuff, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, that sort of thing, uh, it might it might be nice to have it. But but we have such technology nowadays that the money saving, because really you know we end up having to to pay for fuel and time and everything else anyway. Um, it it is becoming less and less important to filmmakers. Uh, who are making military films or military-themed uh, programs uh, to have that DOD support. It's nice, um, but it's certainly not as crucial as it was in years past. Interesting. Aldona Senzikis wants to know, in your filmmaking experience, which branch of the military is most sensitive about its image as portrayed in movies? Uh, you're probably going to hate this but it's the Navy, um, and I'm not sure where that comes from, but there it is. Um, I think that's followed uh, closely probably by the Marine Corps um, and, and less so. I don't know. It's, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to rank them, really. It depends on the subject. It depends on the topic. But the Navy is the Navy's very sensitive um, about these things. Uh, it has to do with... Uh, with the ultimate power of ship's captains, I think, at sea, and and the traditions of the of the Navy, uh, all of which I greatly respect. So I, I understand their sensitivity, but but they can be they can be a little sticky. 
I'm afraid we only have time for one more, Captain Dye. This has been wonderful. Um, William Prom would like to know, is there a period or aspect of any war or conflict that you haven't worked on that you'd most like to? And I think he means historical period, et cetera. Well, sure, yeah. Um, I'd I'd like to um, I'd like to get after uh, some of the early um, banana war uh, episodes. Um, I've I've been wanting to do something with Smedley Butler and and Nicaragua for years and years and years. I've been wanting to do a story, and I'm I'm developing one actually about uh, Marines guarding the mail in the 1920s, which I think is a, is a terrific subject. Um, and, and I want to do something on Korea, which, which I'm, I'm trying desperately to do now because I think that's really an underappreciated um, uh, military effort. Uh, so, so those kind of things. The smaller they are, uh, the more appealing they are to me. I, I, want to do small, I want to do big films about small stories. Sounds good. I agree about Korea. There aren't enough of those out there. Um, well, thank you, Captain Dye. This has been wonderful, and thank you to all the webinar attendees for these great questions. Um, I regret we didn't have time to get to all of them, but we do thank you for attending and taking part in the webinar. And again, thanks, Captain Dye. I've really enjoyed our time together, and based on the thoughtful questions we received from the audience, I can tell they did as well. Uh, the well on demand thank you very much, Eric. I'm I'm a big fan of, uh, of Naval History Magazine. It's sitting on my coffee table right now, as a matter of fact. Well, you just made my day, Captain. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, folks. Well, the on-demand version of this webcast is going to be available approximately one day after the webcast, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So be sure to go back and archive it again. Meanwhile, have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you at the next session which begins at 7 p.m. Eastern Time.